Hello everyone, welcome to this presentation. Uh, my name is Peter Munkellingsen. I'm a computer scientist from Tromsø, Norway. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about next generation microcontroller programming. Um, subtitle of this talk is Zero Cost Abstractions for Better Embedded Programming. And we're going to come uh, more into that during the talk. Uh, this is a topic that I've talked quite a lot about in the past. Uh, it all kind of started in 2020 at FOSTEM, um, in actual physical FOSTEM in Brussels, with a presentation called NIM on Everything. Uh, that presentation was about how you can compile NIM for JavaScript and run it in the browser. You can compile it uh, for the server and run your backend in, in uh, NIM. Uh, it was how like you can run it in graphical applications on your computer. And I mentioned you can also run it uh, on a microcontroller like an Arduino or something like that. And at that point, that was kind of like with an asterisk. It was it was doable, but it wasn't very pleasant. It wasn't uh, it wasn't the greatest experience. Um, then last year, I held a talk called Optimizing for Humans. Uh, and this was a talk where I um, where I wrapped the libraries, like the Arduino libraries, uh, and I created a game for um, a, a small game console called the Arduboy, um, just, just to try it out. Um, and that, as I said, wrapped the Arduino libraries, but built on top of that more ergonomic abstractions. So, for example... Um, I could load images in during compile time, convert them into the format that the drawing library for the Arduboy Boy expected, and then put that uh, directly into the NIM code uh, and just have all of that work. So I could just call load sprite in my code, draw sprite, and it will all it would all do what it was or what I would expect it to do. And I implemented a game, as I said, all the levels and all the images and stuff were loaded on compile time. Um, it was pretty cool. But while I was doing that, I got sort of more into low level programming of these uh, microcontrollers. Uh, and during NIMCONF uh, later that same year, I held a presentation titled Why I Wrote My Keyboard Firmware in NIM. Um, that was based off of a series I did. Uh, I streamed the entire process of creating this keyboard firmware from like completely from scratch. Um, and those videos are also available on YouTube. I think there's about like 24 hours of, of content there. And it takes you through like the whole pro process from sitting down with an empty file to a fully working um, keyboard with multiple layers and all of that. And all the while I was doing this, I was trying to write these, uh, all of my components as libraries that I could reuse for similar projects in the future. And this brings me to today and today's talk. Because what I've done now is I've extracted all of that, made a library, and that's what I'm here to talk about. Uh, but before we get into that, um, I just want to briefly touch on why do we want next generation microcontroller programming? Uh, because I'm not the only one sort of doing this. Um, we have, as we will see later in the talk, we have Rust running on C uh, on Arduinos. Uh, we have Tiny Go running on Arduinos or Go. Uh, we have Sig, uh, which is uh, up and coming in the same space. So why, why are so many people interested in next generation? And I call it next generation, but this, why do we suddenly have a new wave of microcontroller programming stuff? Um, I think it's mostly because we want something more elegant. Uh, Arduino, which is the logo I have up here on screen, you program it in C++. Um, it works. You have a lot of libraries. I mean, the the thing that they've done for the hobbyist ecosystem of microcontroller programming is frankly quite amazing. 
but C++ isn't the most elegant language, language, and a lot of the abstractions and stuff like that, just for new newcomers, this seems like a bit of a high barrier of entry. Um, we, in my case, I also want more performance. Uh, when I looked into Arduino, um, I realized just how much performance it left on the table. Um, how much uh, more we could squeeze out of these microcontrollers without losing um, without losing anything. So we could be more expressive, we can write more elegant code and still have more performance, which is kind of my goal. Um, there are, of course, some that go more for the more elegant, less for the performance, such as MicroPython. Um, but the ones I, I have with me here today are definitely on the more elegant, more performance side of things. Of course, the downside of this next generation sort of wave is library support. Library supports and board support. Uh, if you go through TinyGo, they have a list supported uh, boards. Um, Rust and SIG don't really have that, and I'll get into that more afterwards. Um, but all of them, like in Arduino, you can just download the library for pretty much any sensor you can find, uh, and everything just sort of works together and it's, you can make it work really quickly. Um, there's also a lot, they're also typically a lot harder to set up these new languages. Um, but I'm going to get more into that, um, in a little bit. So. These are the things that I've sort of benchmarked uh, in this um, and sort of played around with a little bit to get a feeling of them. Um, top left here, of course, we have uh, Arduino. Uh, then we have TinyGo. We have Rust, uh, Zig, and Nim. But the crown is on a honey badger. Um, we'll get back to that. Um, so Arduino, everyone sort of knows Arduino, definitely bonus points for ease of setup. You can download, install, just choose your board, flash your code. It all sort of just works. It's, it's really the least, like the path of least resistance if you can program uh, C++ or C. Um, TinyGo. Also a very, very nice project. The, um, this was definitely the closest to the Arduino experience I had in all of these. Uh, basically, you just download TinyGo and then you have TinyGo build, TinyGo flash, uh, select the board and all of that just sort of kind of worked. Um, then Rust and Zig remind me of the situation that has been the case for NIM. Um, you have libraries sort of spread out. Like you can go, if you want this board, you can go here and do these things. Uh, this is an old repo that some guy made for a blog post a year ago. Code doesn't really compile anymore, but it's there. If you know the language, maybe you can figure it out. They're sort of in, in that category. Um, TinyGo, uh, I mean, for the four that I didn't know, or for, for the three of these I didn't know um, already, TinyGo was the only one of those three that I didn't have to go into the, uh, into the um, channel, um, <clears throat> into the IRC channel and ask for help in order to make the program, uh, the tiny little program I, I made even run. Um, so TinyGo was super easy in that regard. Um, Rust and Sega, as I said, more a bit of finding a repository that kind of worked and tweak it. And in Rust case, I had to use an older version of the compiler, which isn't a great sign. Um, Zig was a lot easier. That was basically just tweaking some stuff. And I mean, Zig is still not 1.0, so you kind of expect that kind of thing. Uh, the Honey Badger down here. Uh, is the logo for my new library, 
um, which I've called uh, Ratel or Rathel. It's a Afrikaans word. Uh, it means honey badger. Um, so the this library is is what we are benchmarking here as as NIM. Um, so yeah, introducing Rathel or Ratel um, for us non Dutch speakers or Afrikaans speakers. Um, the the really big focus of of uh, Ratel is zero cost abstractions. Um, basically, I want to create a library where you can write your code in a nice, expressive, elegant way that is NIM, um, but don't pay a price for the abstractions. So everything is defined as compile time things or compile time objects. Um, everything is sort of unpacked and, and made into super efficient C code uh, during compile time. So you really don't have to worry about um, most of that stuff. It's also designed and written in such a way that it's super extensible. So if you go to, if you go and download the Rachel library right now, and you don't find support for your board, but want to add that support, you can write your own package that adds support for a board without adding it into uh, my, or into the Rachel um, repository. Uh, this is similar to how Arduino, you can pull in new boards and new sensors. Um, so that was a really big focus. Um, of course, it's just regular, good old fashioned NIM. Um, Go has, the project is called Tiny Go, but they also talk about having a different compiler and stuff not being implemented for the microcontroller. I'm not sure how much of that is sort of a dialect of the language and how much of that is just standard library not really doing what it's supposed to. I mean, for, for none of these, I think you can do stuff like open a file because we don't have files on these microcontrollers. Um, so some stuff just doesn't make sense on these, um, on these controllers. And I think I'm not entirely sure if that's what's happening in the case of Dynago. But in this case, it's just normal everyday NIM um, that you know and love. Of course, since NIM builds via C, this means that we can really easily uh, get more boards in. Uh, defining, especially like the AVR boards, uh, defining a new one is a matter of minutes. Um, defining something weirder like the uh like the uh, esp series of boards for example will require a little bit of tinkering but it should still be pretty easy because it builds to see uh, we don't have to wait for llvm patches and stuff like that as long as we can help with the right c code everything will work um in the same vein that it is extensible is also sort of integrated with nimble so Nimble is the package manager for NIM. And the way I've designed this is that um, sensors and boards all just live in the normal Nimble ecosystem. And you just require them in your Nimble project file, uh, just as you normally would. And um, then you can Nimble build uh, and you can have your own task, Nimble Flash, um, to put this onto your board. But more on that uh, later on. But it's really it's sort of integrated into the NIM ecosystem. This isn't some extra tool that, that uh, we have to maintain with a database full of stuff. And you know, it's really tightly integrated into the NIM ecosystem. And of course, you can use other packages, uh, packages for data structures, for example. Or I showed in a previous talk where I used uh, Zero Functional, uh, a functional programming li library that again, tries to do zero cost abstraction. And it works really well on, on microcontrollers. Um, so this is uh, the example that I made for uh, Ratel, uh, or this is Ratel, the Ratel implementation of the sample code that I will, that I built for all of these different targets. 
Um, as you can see, we just import board and we import stuff from the board. Um, no mention here of which board we're actually importing from. Um, and this is, this is on purpose. Basically a compile time flag will define which uh, board you import the stuff from. Uh, so the code can look exactly the same between different boards as, as long as both those boards supports the same thing. Like obviously if you don't have a serial port, um, if you don't have a serial port on your board, this code won't work. So um, you have to do something else. Um, currently we have this main uh, function signature that will probably change. I'm probably going to go for at least a setup, maybe also like setup loop, like in uh, Arduino, of course, uh, then with options. Um, and the reason for that is some boards might require some setup. Uh, for example, the Teensy, you should set the, uh, the um, clock speed. That's not required on this board. Um, and some boards just require a little bit of setup. And I really want to be able to hide that away in the board library and not have that sort of in, in your actual um, code here. But all of that should be hidden behind switches so you can turn it off and, and go back to the zero, um, to the zero abstraction. And of course you can do this. Um, if you don't use the setup function or the setup macro, all it would do is create this uh, procedure for you. As you guys can see, it looks pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, initialize the zero port, send some data. The little, little P there in front of the strings, that is uh, progmem. So that actually takes the string and puts it in program memory. And what you get is then a, a, a new type, a distinct type um, that invokes a reading from program memory when you try to access it. So in this case, uh, ser serial.send, that is an override uh, or an overload for uh, progmem of CString, um, which loads it from pro progmem and sends it. Then we have LED, high and low. LED is just a, an alias for the pin on the board. That's the internal LED. Um, so that is, that is really just a, a constant definition of a pin. This gets boiled down to like, write this like or this into this port register so the code is really boils down to something super tiny um so let's do a little bit of size comparison i built that example in all of the five languages that i showed at the beginning and um so here is the arduino implementation looks pretty pretty similar actually to the to the nim implementation we can see we use about two kilobytes of program memory 184 bytes of data memory uh, then we have the tiny go implementation here we're down to 805 bytes of program memory a little bit up 218 bytes of data memory uh, then we have rust on micro or rust for embedded uh, that is 522 bytes of program memory with 29 bytes of data memory, which is pretty good. Um, then SIG at 367 bytes of program memory with 39 bytes of uh, program memory. One note about this one, um, ZIG has, so I compiled all of these with optimized for size flags. Uh, Arduino doesn't really have a separate option for that, but I checked that it actually, that it passes uh, optimized size to the GCC compiler at least. Uh, but for all the other ones, I set them in sort of minimal size builds. Uh, the SIG version here, um, when I did that, it dropped from 680, I believe it was, bytes uh, in progmem, but that version had zero bytes of data memory. So here it appears like between the release safe and release small um, options, it seems that we boil down to sort of a choice between program memory and uh, and data memory. 
which is interesting. Uh, and then, of course, with the rate tool, you get 290 bytes and zero bytes of data memory. Um, data memory is kind of like the RAM of your microcontroller. Progr uh, program memory is more like the binary size. Um, so this graph is a little bit weird because we have 32 kilobytes of program memory, but only two kilobytes of data memory. And the more data memory, so these are like static variables, global variables, stuff that we know must go into, into sort of RAM, into the data memory. Um, but that leaves us less space for allocations if we want to do allocations uh, during, uh, during runtime. And just to mention, um, we're not using any garbage collected memory here. Uh, so even though we compiled with GC arc, it's actually not doing anything in this case. Um, I tried like using stir format uh, or stir utils, uh, take a string, take the number of the iteration of the loop, uh, turn that to hex and then send that over serial. And that came down to about 1,900 something odd bytes uh, of program memory and uh, I think it was 60 or 70 bytes of, of uh, data memory. So that's still better than Arduino and here we're turning things into like string objects and allocating and deallocating and involving the, the garbage collector. Uh, but typically for these kind of applications, you maybe don't want to do that. Um, and uh, just a little side note, while we have these numbers up, uh, the keyboard firmware that I wrote for my previous talk, when implemented with uh, Raytool and uh, tweaked for, actually tweaked for latency, but some tiny tweaks, uh, that is down to 2,300 bytes of program memory and I believe 14 bytes of data memory. Uh, so that entire keyboard firmware, which speaks to two keyboard halves over I squared C port expanders, so two port expanders uh, with two layers to the layout. So I can switch, switch the layout uh, while I'm typing on it. Uh, all of that is smaller so that is numbers for the Teensy and the, just the normal Arduino Blink example on the Teensy is about 100 bytes larger than the keyboard firmware. So you really can save a lot of performance here or data size. But as I said, that, that graph was a bit weird because we had 32 kilobytes versus two kilobytes. So here it is in percentages. Um, as we can see, Go and, and uh, Arduino actually take up, for this very trivial example, take up about 10% uh, of your data memory. Uh, the Arduino, uh, by the way, uses the same trick with progmem uh, strings. I'm not entirely sure what the other platforms do. Um, but as you can see here, 10% um, of your RAM just for starting up the program, basically, which is interesting. Um, so where is Rattle now? Um, as I said, I wrote this initially for my keyboard. So I have pins and ports, obviously. Uh, I squared C, that is, I wrote that for the port expanders. Um, I have a pro program abstractions be able, being able to put not only strings, but like arrays and objects and all kinds of stuff into program memory. Uh, I wrote serial implementation for this presentation. Um, and I also have sort of turned all of this into a library and made the, that structure, uh, which makes it extensible. Uh, and that is something I really think will be important uh, to, to make this popular. Because if I can write one library for a sensor that uses a zero cost abstraction, and you can use that on a different board without ever seeing my board or knowing what kind of board I'm implementing it for, that would be super cool. And that is what allows us um, to grow into the space where Arduino is, where you can just pick and choose boards and sensors and that kind of stuff. 
Uh, so that is what we have right now. Of course, I also have the keyboard library and the library for the port expanders that I use in the actual keyboard. Uh, so hopefully, if you're doing something with that, that would be interesting. Uh, but what is next? What what Where do we go from here? Um, I'm going to be implementing SPI, first of all. Um, that is probably going to be done by the time this talks, talk goes live uh, during FOSTEM. Um, I also want to do a build tool. And this is like the, the tiny go build, tiny go flash kind of thing. Um, and I really, I really think that is one thing that really set tiny go apart for me uh, from the other ones. The other ones felt more like, oh yeah, you can compile a language for this platform similar to what we have had for NIM um, for a really long time now. But what I want to do is, or, or what I want to do with this is bring a sort of ease of use, that, that really simple like build and flash and yeah. And for that, I think, I think we're going to need a build tool. Um, so I, I might start out working on that. That will of course also be expandable. Uh, so for example, the ESP stuff is Vast, vastly different from the from the Arduino stuff. And of course, the big one, more chips, and more devices. Um, this is where I hope that you guys can help me out uh, because I don't have all the microcontrollers in the world. I don't have all the sensors in the world. Uh, but if we can start implementing RATL for more of the microcontrollers that we already have wrapped, like I know there's a lot of microcontrollers that are wrapped in NIM. Uh, the ESP line, uh, we have the Pico. Um, we also have stuff being done on the AVR controllers and other, I, there's even a, a Bluetooth chip, I believe, with uh, native NIM libraries. If we can take those and bring them sort of into the same ecosystem, um, that would be awesome. Also, of course, devices. Um, I'm going to start implementing my my uh, sensors, uh, like temperature sensors and some screens I have lying around, um, some gas sensors. I have a bunch of sensors. Uh, so I'm going to start implementing those. And if you guys can start implementing your sensors to work with this, that would be awesome. Um, currently, the two boards I have written this for is the TNC 2.0 and the Arduino Uno or the uh, Atmega 32, oh, 328P in the Atmega 32U4. Uh, so if you have those, you can already get started. Maybe by the time this goes live, we have more chips. Um, so that was pretty much it for me. Um, when this goes live, if not before, um, the library Ray tool is going to be up on my GitHub. So github.com slash uh, pmonk slash Ray tool. Uh, there you're going to be, find the library. Uh, also, I'm probably going to post something on my website when I do, petermi.net. Um, and honestly, I'm probably going to set up uh, a website for Ray tool uh, as well. Um, I really want, when, when this comes out, I hope to have um, a guide for you guys how to start integrating your own boards um, and how to get started programming with Raytool. So hopefully all that is done uh, by the time this goes live. Uh, and if not, I'm sorry, I'm probably still working on it. Uh, but that's it for me today. Um, it's been a pleasure meeting you. Hopefully the next time we will be back in Brussels uh, and can hold this face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, that was it for Next Generation Microcontroller Programming. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope that we can start coding RATOL together. Thank you.